and welcome to Shelf Life. It's time to tuck yourselves in and grab your teddies because this episode is all about kids' books. We're also taking a look at some of the great initiatives around at the moment that encourage children to get interested in books and to learn to love reading. Booktionauts, let's do this. It's very cute. I have to say that one of my favourite things to do is to snuggle up at night with my little boy and he grabs stack loads of books and I'm sure it's a sneaky tactic to get us to stay up all night. You're lucky. I read the same book over and over and over Thank and you, over Mrs. Elf. Touché. If any parents out there have recommendations or tips to help their kids discover books, please let us know on social media. That's what it's there for. So with the kids in mind then, we're going to take you to the inaugural Sydney Writers Children's Festival. Once the domain of grown-ups, the festival has broadened its reach, now bringing a younger audience to reading. As you'll see, the festival includes a mobile book bus, arts and crafts, and readings by some of the country's most exciting authors. But first, let's take a look at the important work that the Indigenous Literacy Foundation is doing with children all over Australia. We even get to take part in the Great Book Swap. We're trading books and, and learning about people and Torres Strait Island people. We're here today celebrating an Indigenous Literacy Day and it's a national event set, celebrated by schools, libraries, uh, businesses and uh, other organisations across Australia. It's really to raise awareness about children who live in remote communities who don't have access to books and uh, literacy resources. Our foundation runs three programs. We do a free book supply program. We've delivered 120,000 books to more than 200 communities across Australia. But we also do community publishing and where possible we're looking at doing more of that in language and we've published and funded 37 projects in our three and a half years and final part of our program which is really important is the focus on early childhood early literacy and that's about getting books into and the right sort of books into the hands of mothers and babies and toddlers and in one community we've translated those books like the very hungry caterpillar into first language and the results are amazing. Like most people I was um, shocked and, and upset to see that the reading literacy rates were so low in the outlying remote communities and I wanted to do something about it and it was just thrilling to see that the publishing industry had created the Indigenous Literacy Foundation to address that very problem, to get the books out there, literacy resources, to work with whatever each community needs to, to get those kids reading and engaging with words. I got signed by Andy Griffin and Alicia Heights. I reckon this is going to be the best book. Really happy to be here today at the Sydney Opera House celebrating National Indigenous Literacy Day. I'm a long time ambassador because uh, I'm aware of the, the joy of reading and that brings to my life every day. And I think all Australian kids, regardless of where they live, should have access to books and have adequate literacy skills. The Great Book Swap is a very simple fundraising idea and it's run in schools, in libraries, in book clubs, even businesses across Australia and the idea is just to bring in a book that you've loved, swap it with another one, you can build a big event around it, get an elder in to talk about their writing, their story, celebrate with some music, have a cup of tea um, around it and it's all about literacy, us enjoying stories and that's what we're about. It's amazing. I've seen this before, but this is even more mayhem than usual. And uh, the idea of swapping books, I would not have predicted, could be so exciting. But, you know, when you're in a bookshop yourself or a second-hand bookshop, you find that little treasure. It, it makes your day and often is your friend for life. So um, really exciting to see so many kids excited about books. reading because it's like takes you on adventures and you've learned different things about reading and there's lots of kinds of books you can read about all kinds of things. I like about it reading makes me be quiet and it makes me be full of sleep. That you get to imagine what happens next. Because you learn new words and they might be magic words we have at school. I like to read best on the bed or couch because it's comfy. This is our first ever dedicated children's festival. We've always done children's programs but we decided it's a good time to do a dedicated festival. First one ever and it's in Western Sydney. We're super excited about it. I think 
think it's been a long time coming. Also, it's just such a vibrant children's industry. Hello, Grug. Vibrant children's industry in Australia at the moment. Kids are, are more into reading than ever before. And there are so many kids in Western Sydney with such a hunger for events around books and reading. So it was time. We've just had Russ the Travelling Story Bus travelling around for two weeks. He's a big mobile book exchange. We've got stories from the Pajama Verse tonight, which is our big night of interactive storytelling. And next week we've got an author roadshow. So 20 of Australia's best children's authors travelling to six key libraries all across Western Sydney. I'm glad that there are things on like this, and especially in the Western suburbs, because there's lots of kids here and these kind of things should be available for them. Well, Zoe's recently got really into reading books and instead of storybooks we read a chapter every night of Enid Blyton and all sorts of other books that she's been given as gifts so it's just to keep her interested and use her imagination. It's pajamas so we thought we'll join in as well. <laughs> I've been part of the quality training for Bus the Bus so we probably have heard a lot about that so I'm um, it's always really good to see the kids get a lot out of looking through the books and the parents as well. So they're really engrossed and they're really excited about going away with the new book. So um, it's really good to see those. I think it's really important for kids to get into reading and it's really fun and very rewarding. I'm here doing live illustrations on stage tonight. I've done lots of school talks before and lots of other events but my first time drawing with the GoPro above for a whole stage event so I'm excited. It's just vital that kids get access to books because if you don't have access to good books, you don't go on to love books for the rest of your life and you know, that's where all good stories come from. And also it gives you access to, to the whole skill of reading, so that gives you access to knowledge, which is one of the most important things. Russ the bus has just blown everybody away. And then just kids on the bus, so excited about bringing a book, swapping books, comparing books with other kids. And just seeing them get that excited about books and reading has been amazing. So this is our first children's festival and we're just hoping to get bigger and better as the years go on. Jackie, welcome to Shelf Life. Yuppie, thank you. Now you've written well over 140 books, which is just staggering, but we're here to talk about your latest achievement, which is your role as the National Children's Laureate for 2014 and 2015. Can you tell us a little about what that position involves? The position is really inspiring people with the power of a book to change lives. And having said that, it's really up to every laureate to work out how they get that message across, which way, um, what particular things that they want to emphasise. And for me, it's the right of every child to read. I am profoundly dyslexic and everyone can read. I've got a friend who has no eyes and yet she reads at least a book a day. I've got another friend who was 36 before he learnt to read and again he now reads a book a day and as I said I'm dyslexic. Everyone can read and if any child has been at any school for more than a year and they cannot read then we have failed them because when you fail to teach a child to read, um, in this modern day they are excluded not just from this extraordinary heritage of books but also from things like email, from the internet, even from texting. It is the one absolute essential that we must read. Look, reading is not just about communicating. There has been fascinating research that when young people learn to read, they literally become more intelligent. Reading literally creates new neurons and new neurons within the brain as you read and as you imagine. Television does not do this. So we are not just giving the kids the intelligence and the tools, but we are also giving them the dreams to create the future. Well, let me ask about this because what, what strikes me is that children at a very early age, my experience anyway, is that they love reading, but then very often at a certain age that changes and you hear a lot of kids who you know, get to a certain point and say, I, I hate reading, I don't like reading. They associate it with school. What's happening there? Okay, so many p parents now realise, yes, you read to your kids. And actually, my grand dog has also discovered um, that he likes being read to, by the way. But um, as soon as my grandson started choosing the books to be read at night, there is Hank the dog looking very, very interested. Oh, what are we going to read tonight? I have no idea that dogs like bedtime stories. But once kids start learning to read themselves, most parents then 
give them the book and leave them to read. And there is a real difference between the books that kids can read and the books that are what I call the magic book, the book which will really absolutely entrance them and really get them to reach for another book and another book and another book. So once kids learn to read, yes, give them the books that will extend them as readers, but keep reading those magic books, the books that they are fascinated with, because otherwise the books are too simple and they will get bored. Kids are watching TV but because they haven't been given alternatives. They haven't been given books they would be fascinated with. There haven't been games to play. Even more these days, they haven't been given time. Often it is just one book which will make them realise exactly the magic they can find in books. There are so many things to pick up on there. Something I'd like to, to go back to is that idea of that moment when children or parents stop reading to their children and yes. hand the book over. And yes. what strikes me in, in thinking about the magic book is that it requires parents to still be involved in reading in order to know what, what excites their child. I keep getting emails from parents saying, can I please have the list of magic books? And they don't realise there is no one list. If there was one list every kid would love reading, you need to talk to the child to say what you like. We have to give kids the respect and freedom we give adults to say there are millions of books, there are hundreds of genres. What do you like? Or even better, Turn them into foragers, free range books, take them into bookstores, take them into libraries and let them free range and let them take out a great big pile of books and give them permission to say, this book is boring. Teach them to taste books, leaf through the book. But if it's boring, put it down and get another one. And you've been doing a lot of travelling around the country, particularly under the Laureateship, and have you, um, have you come across any inspiration, I mean many inspirational people or projects who are promoting literacy and reading? It's been the most extraordinary year so far because everywhere I go there are these just incredible inspirational people on the smell of an oil rag and not even that creating the most wonderful things for kids. But also too, as I've been going around Australia, I've been asking kids to write a diary for me for next year. And that's one of my projects as a laureate. What I'd like for 2015 is every day next year to have a different diary from a different person around Australia, telling me who they are, what they love, what they hate, what they're interested in, what their day has been like, so that all around Australia we can read about young people's days. In 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, we will have a record of what it is like to be a young person in Australia in 2015. Jackie, I think that's the perfect place to end. Thank you so much for joining us on Shelf Life. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. On my way to Sierra Leone, my sister sitting next to me in a red car. There is a man sitting close to us on the back seat of the car. He is too ugly and old, wearing dirty clothes and too scary to look at. Preschool was the days of my life, not doing homework, assignments and no exams. The only thing that reminds me of these days is a photo in my wallet that my mum took when I was in preschool. I love to wear a hat look like John Cena. I like my friend looks like my brother and my sister. I want to make my dream to come to true. The life is like a pencil. The pencil is still writing until the life end. At the end, the pencil will finish. Nothing will be relating to the pencil except the beautiful writing. Mom lays in around the house, but dedicatedly asks me, the oldest child and the only daughter, to cook rice for a family of eight, mostly boys. Dad doesn't eat regularly at home, and basically he doesn't eat at all. I may not know his reasons, but I was super fair he ate at least once in a while. Brother, she don't care about my heart. She can't hear my voice. So forget her. It's hard as I try to stop breathing.
Welcome back. Remember those talented teenagers we showed you before the break? They co-created that film with the sweatshop team out in Bankstown. We went along to the launch to hear their stories. So today we're here to launch On My Way to Sierra Leone, which is a literary video. And the idea of a literary video is transforming literature from something that exists on the printed page to something that can physically exist on the screen. My mother left when I was one, but somehow she's still here. And so what we do is somehow we work with a collective of writers. In this case, they're students from three high schools across Sydney. And they develop creative works with our sweatshop writers over a period of 10 weeks. And then from there, we edit the pieces into a video where children are reading to camera. And so the outcome is what we consider to be a collection of literary works that can be watched instead of read. Which is one of the last letters. At that time, I really wanted to change my name to a name start with A or B so I could be the first. Sweatshop is the Western Sydney literacy movement. And we believe that the first way to engage in literature is to start with literacy. Because literacy, as the uh, black cultural theorist Bell Hooks says, uh, determines how you see what you see. So we have a, a very direct engagement with local communities, in which case we go directly into schools and we work with young people who are really starting off in their understanding and experience with literature and in particular the English language. And from there we generate uh, creative works through processes of critical thinking. Once the stories are developed, traditionally we would have loved to have published these kinds of things in books, but our culture is changing so rapidly that uh, people's attention spans are changing, people's engagement in, in visual culture is changing, and uh, most importantly, there are avenues which are accessible to some people and not accessible to others. So what we wanted to do was create something that can be accessed by all people and quite immediately so that there is an opportunity to spread a collection of stories produced by young people almost straight after they've produced it. And then we're also challenging the conventions of English so that we're asking people of um, low literacy, uh, at least from a, an, a, an English perspective, um, or from uh, non-English speaking backgrounds, to look at different kinds of cultural contexts in which they can engage in literature. It's actually something quite unique to the western suburbs of Sydney. We're seeing new voices that are uniquely Australian and that have not been represented before. And in this case, literally, you know, come to life on the screen. So today we are bringing the students from all three schools, so Joseph Banks High School, Vanilla High School and Sydney Secondary Campus Balmain, to watch the literary video that we've produced. And our idea in, in bringing the students to the university is to give them an, a direct engagement with, with the idea of creative writing on a university. Because I think for a lot of young people, they love creative writing and they love the idea of becoming great writers, but they don't really know that there are actual avenues to become a writer once you've finished high school. There's only ever a romantic idea of how you become a, a writer, but we want to give them a, a very real experience. And so, one of the ways we do that is, of course, just inviting them to the space and showing them that it, it actually exists. And then secondly, introducing them to our writers because these young people have worked with sweatshop writers for the last six months and now not only will we, will we screen their work but we'll start the ceremony by introducing them to the work of Luke Carmen, Tamash Nohokian and Stephen Pham in an attempt to show them that actually some of these writers that you worked with for six months are brilliant writers who make a career out of this stuff right here at the University of Western Sydney. Hi, this week I read and reviewed a great story called Matilda. This book is written by one of my favourite authors, Raul Dahl. I loved this book because it was really funny and exciting too. It's based on a young girl called Matilda Wormwood who is a genius with mean, stubborn parents who seem to think that watching television is the best thing a human can possibly do in their lives and that being smart gets you nowhere in life. But Matilda was different. By the time she was three, she had taught herself how to read and by the time she was four, she had read every child book in the entire library. Matilda wanted something to read, so she decided to ask for a book. And as you can imagine, her parents got absolutely furious. 
Soon after, Matilda started school and she met a kind, nurturing teacher called Miss Honey, who was very nice to Matilda. But when she met the headmistress, everything changed. Miss Trunchbull was the name of this mean, nasty, cruel headmistress who thought all of her students were rotten little stinkers. But she better watch out because Matilda has a few tricks up her sleeve that she is not afraid to use. But I don't want to ruin the surprise. So if you really want to know more about Matilda and her exciting adventures, then I would definitely recommend reading this book because I personally really enjoyed reading it and I'm sure you will too. Hi, I reviewed this week a novel by Jackie French. It's a children's fiction story called The Dog Who Loved a Queen. It's a heartfelt story that everyone with a dog would understand and enjoy. The story begins by explaining the history of Mary Queen of Scots, which is very useful because I had no idea who she was. And then the story really starts. The Dog Who Loved a Queen is told through a beloved Scottish terrier named Folly. It starts with Folly as a puppy at the farm where he is born and raised by his mum and his two other brothers and sisters. He is taken with his sister to meet the Queen and become her lifelong companion. Unfortunately, on the way to the Queen, his sister dies. But when Folly sets sight on the Queen, he forgets about everything else and becomes very devoted to her. After that, many more exciting things happen. And then Mary gets the bad news that she is sent to death. But her dog hides under her dress as she is led to the guillotine. He waits under her dress in hope that she soon will return to her chambers, but I don't want to spoil it, so I guess you'll have to read the book yourself. This book is touching, has great description, and was very enjoyable and exciting. And for all those reasons and many more, I very highly recommend this book. However, I do think it would be more appropriate for eight years and over, because Jackie Fetch is a very good descriptive writer. This week's Shelf Life theme has been Kids on the Book and of course we're giving away a great prize pack of children's books to celebrate. For your chance to win this wonderful collection, simply head to the Shelf Life website and tell us in one short paragraph what your favourite book was when you were a child and why. Write your entry in the contact section and make sure you put Kids on the Book competition in the subject line. Good luck! I feel like I've aged a decade since those reviews. Mm, try 20. <laughs> of course that's you, not me. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our special children's episode. It uh, really brought out our inner child. Make sure you check out anything you missed on our website and get onto Facebook or Twitter to let us know what you thought of the show. We're back on your screens next week and we would love you to join us again when we'll be bringing you the very best of our up and coming Aussie talent. Until then, enjoy your week, do some reading and we'll see you soon for some more great stories from Shelf Life. Bye bye. Bye. bye.